last verse, hymn 58, on the last verse. This is my Father's word. Oh, let me never forget that the dark one seems of so strong. This is my Father's word. The battle is not done. Jesus. Good morning. It's good to see you out this morning. How many are glad to be here? Amen. Hey, that's a pretty good response. Praise the Lord. Amen. Pastor Ashley, would you open us in prayer, sir? Morning, Lord. We thank you for such a great salvation, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we just pray that you meet with us this morning, Lord, and that uh, you speak to our hearts through the preaching and teaching of your word. Lord, we thank you for uh, this country. Uh, we just recently celebrated Veterans Day where we have the freedom uh, and the authority from Jesus Christ to share the gospel. Lord, we uh, thank you for any member or visitor that may be here this morning. Lord, we pray that you speak to hearts that if there be one that's not saved, Lord, that you uh, show them your love, your great salvation. And Lord, we just ask that uh, you be glorified in all that's said and done. And we just thank you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's all be seated. Again, it is good to great. It's really great to see each and every one of you this morning. Also thankful for anybody who might be visiting for the first time. First time. Do we have any introductions? Yes. It's so good to have you, Sonia. Amen. Such a happy looking group there. By the time we're done with you, you won't. No, I'm just kidding. We're happy to have you. Amen. For sure. All right, Mrs. Miller, you okay over there? Okay. Anybody else? See, that's a we do that on purpose. That that got you awake right there, didn't it? Amen. <laughs> Anybody else? Any others? Yes. Well, thank you for being here. Amen. <laughs> let's make sure, man. Let's make sure that they get a uh, uh, a special gift from us, thanking you for being with us. And uh, there's a little card there. I'd like you to fill it out. Put your social security number, your blood type. <laughs> Everything that, you know, uh, your bank account, anything you got. No, just kidding. Totally, totally. Well, kind of. Amen? <laughs> good to have you for sure. Anybody else? Any other introductions? Well, it's sure good to see each and every one of you. And I'm glad that our visitors were able to make their, you know, we're kind of negotiating around the, you know, the back way to get in here and all that. We have guys out front making sure that uh, anyone who might be visiting for the first time gets back here. Let's all help each other to make sure we all end up here, at least for the next uh, Lord willing, a uh, few more weeks. Amen. And so good to have each and every one of you. Amen. Let's do this. We're going to share a few announcements and continue. There is a transformation that's going to take place in just a little bit. At the end of the service, we are going to be setting up uh, for uh, our Thanksgiving uh, dinner, which is at four o'clock today. And uh, we could use your help for sure. Uh, see, Brother Israel, uh, and he's going he's gonna to be the one who's going to make this transformation take place, and we're actually going to be able to come in here and, and uh, fellowship and enjoy, and, and there's going to be some work involved. So all of, uh, all of you who can stick around and help with that, that would be a blessing. And then also, uh, for the food, <laughs> now I got your attention. You say food in a Baptist church, and boy, it just gets real quiet, right? Be here at 3.30 with your food so that the, our folks back there can have everything set up and ready to go for that. Amen? All right. Awana. We will not have Awana this Wednesday, uh, and, but we will resume uh, the 28th. Also, uh, God's creation calendars. Uh, the youth will be selling... The beautiful God's creation, and they really are very, very beautiful calendars. They make great gifts. Maybe you're trying to think of what to get the mailman and others. I mean, these are beautiful. See, Pastor Ashley, uh, or one of our youth, and uh, they'll be happy to fix you up with some calendars. Amen? Amen. 
and uh, always been a great, it's been a great fundraiser, but it's also been a real blessing. You know, think you can have somebody hanging up in their office or their home, uh, a beautiful photo along with scripture and just a great tool to use. And so let's continue to be praying about what is taking place here. Some of you uh, have noticed that, uh, boy, I'll tell you, things are changing more and more. We actually have a balcony. Uh, I, I would be careful not to, uh, and let, let me just say this, let's, let's make sure that we don't have any of our kids or anybody running up and down because now there actually is a balcony up there and somebody could actually go off the other end of it. So let's make sure we stay away from all the construction areas. But our platform's being rebuilt, uh, our, our balcony has been framed up, and we are moving along, folks. We are moving along. You know what? The Lord's probably just going to take us home right the day before we get done. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay, though. Amen? I'll take that. You know what's better than, than being here? Being there. Amen? So we're okay with that. But let's, let's be careful to uh, be serving the Lord in the meantime. Amen? All right. Any other announcement? Okay. Let's continue with the service. Please uh, open our hymnals again to him 557. In thanksgiving, let us praise him. F 557, 557.
Amen. Let's all stand one more time, please, and please uh, turn to him. But 561, 561, we gather together, 561. Anybody know where a mic is? There we go. There we go. We're high tech around here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you so much thanks, Lord, for another brand new day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the blessing, for our health, for everything, Lord. Take control of the service. And these your day, Lord, save souls. And we just stand back and give you all the praise and all the honor. We love you, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Let's dismiss the, our children now. Five, seven, nine. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Yes, I I would invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you neither did we eat any man's bread for not but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. You know, you can just read scripture and get real, your shoes start getting a little tighter on you, you know? Notice verse 12. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well doing. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. It's a sweet and precious time, this time when we gather together uh, here on Sunday morning already. Our hearts and our spirits are filled with 
with all types of acts of worship, uh, even as we hear a precious hymn that speaks to our heart, we are encouraged and thankful for you, Lord. Help us now, Lord, even as we just settle in and focus on, yes, you having your way with each and every one of us. Over the last few weeks, we have been talking about the importance of stewardship. What does it mean to be a good Christian steward? What is a steward? Lord, we want to continue to, to let you show us what we must do, how we must respond to you, Lord. And yes, Lord, if there's even one here this morning who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray, yes, Lord, today that they would get saved. Let us show them from a Bible how they can know for sure that if they die today that they would be uh, with you for all eternity. Speak to hearts, Lord, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. This series of messages has a title. The title is The Christian's Response to Material Values. The Christian's Response to Material Values. I can tell you, I'm not one who preaches a lot on this issue of stewardship. But I do believe that I am charged with the responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God. Amen? It's often easier for us to preach about service, preaching about, uh, the, uh, preaching about heaven and preaching about the Lord working in our lives. And when it comes to this issue of, of stewardship and, and giving, uh, I, I recognize that this is a, a, a very critical and important area of our lives. You know, this is that time of year where we're supposed to, in an extra special way, express thankfulness. Matter of fact, some of you are going to be thankful for, do they still make Rolaids? Do they, do they still make? Yes, I have a whole b a bottle of them in my purse. I don't know, whatever. I don't have a purse, I'm just saying. We're going to be thankful for some of those, you know, things that we can pop in our in our mouths after we have our Thanksgiving dinner this evening, amen? And uh, I just, I just got to tell you, after kind of sliding past the devil's day, well, in too many cases, uh, every day seems to be the devil's day, but he's got one of his own that's set aside. I don't acknowledge it, recognize it, care about it even a little bit, and it's called Halloween. How interesting it is that Halloween is, I mean, the word itself means hallowed evening before. It's the before. In other words, be crazy and go nuts before the hallowed evening. And here we are getting past that holiday, and one of my favorite times of year are, are coming up right now where a specifically Christian holiday, if we'll allow it to be so, is Thanksgiving. For sure, there's no doubt. And then we move on into uh, the birth of Christ. We celebrate Christmas. And that's special. And, and may I say that this can be a time of year when people are especially drawn to the Lord. It can also be a very anxious time of the year. Because some folks are going to do this. They're going to put themselves in debt trying to do what they think they have to do in order to make somebody else happy this Christmas season. Amen? I know people who say, I've, I've got to get this person something because they got me something and I've got to get them something even better. And I know people who, who are actually anxious about that. And, and, and may I just say, that's why I believe it's important that we look to the Lord and ask the Lord to have his way with us when it comes to recognizing that everything, in fact, is his. It sure is, isn't it? And so the Christian's response to material values is so applicable to our lives every day, but especially even this time of year, this season. Notice Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. What a great verse. What a very, very powerful verse. 
This morning we're going to talk about the imperative for Christian stewards. What would be the imperative? I would say this, living within our means. Living within our means. And may I say that all of this has to do with our heart condition. You know, the beautiful special that we just heard, how many enjoyed special music this morning? Amen. Did you hear the message? This hymn that was just sung is one of those very, very amazingly honest and open hymns about struggling in our walk and relationship with the Lord. That's exactly what that hymn is all about. This hymn t uh, talks about, you know, making a decision to serve, but then finding yourself not loving the Lord, not serving the way you should. As a matter of fact, the author of that hymn wrote uh, many, many years later of an account where he had, even after he enjoyed success from that beautiful hymn, had struggled and continued to struggle and fell away from the Lord. And here's what happened. He got to know someone who was studying hymns. As a matter of fact, a lot of people will, will take hymns and they'll add that hymn to their devotions. And it's a great way to, to really uh, round out your devotions. Uh, hymnology, understanding and knowing hymns is a good thing. Well, uh, this person... Was, list, was, was reading through and studying uh, the very hymn that he had written. And it broke his heart. He thought, wow, this hymn is encouraging my friend and I'm not where I know I need to be. I'm not, I'm not anywhere near where I need to be. And it, and it just it broke him and caused him to really turn to the Lord. You see, giving is all about expression of heart, isn't it? I mean, it really is. After it's all said and done, giving is another example of what God is doing. This, this morning we talked about revival in Sunday school, and I, and I got to tell you something. When revival breaks out, you don't have to twist people's arms about service. You don't have to somehow trick people into doing this or that. You don't have to come up with any kind of a scheme or any kind of a trick. Uh, God just works in people's heart. And the more we appreciate and realize that giving of our talent, which we see demonstrated here in a wonderful way, and giving of our time, which we see, yes, I am so thankful for what we see happening uh, here at Maranatha Baptist Church, you know, when there's a need, people step up and people serve. And giving of our treasure is all, yes, it's all about our heart condition. And so we're asking the Lord to help us to see in a greater way what our responsibility is. And what does it mean to be a steward? And we'll talk a little bit more about this into the message, but don't forget as stewards, we are managers of what, in fact, is God's. I mean, it's sure easy to say that, but how about in our heart, live that. I am a manager of what, in fact, is God. So, are we going to be good managers or bad managers? If, if we got hired to be the manager, would we be able to keep our job? That's a good question to ask. You know... Who do you want to see when you will go into a restaurant and things aren't right? The manager. I want to talk to the manager. Things aren't right. We don't very often say, I want to talk to the manager. Things are really good. <laughs> Be kind of nice if we did things like that. But how about you and I? What kind of managers are we? Well, tonight, it will be tonight by the time I get done. <laughs> right now, I want our understanding of this imperative to take hold today. How many would agree that really the number one problem for Christians today is, I'm sure, not living within their means? 
not living within their means. And you know, even as I pray about this message and, and, and think about how uh, I, I, I want the Lord to use me this morning, I'm always anxious and I'm, and I'm very careful to say this. This message is for me. This message is for you. It's not for the person sitting next to you. Because when I start talking about some of the things that I'm going to talk about this morning, the real truth is we usually are very, very keen to see where we think others are going wrong. Yeah, I'll tell you what, he's preaching to brother such and such sitting right behind me. Okay, I'm not, don't look behind you. I didn't really mean it literally, but that's where we are lots of times. And we do that with every message that we hear. I've actually literally had people over the years, <laughs> over now the decades, walk up to me and say, man, I sure wish brother such and such was here to hear that message, amen. And I'm thinking, I sure wish you would have heard the message. I mean, you know. But, you know, this whole business of living within our means, I got to tell you, uh, we look and see what we think others are doing, and then we just kind of focus on them. Let's, let's help, let's ask the Lord to help us to focus on me today. Now, that doesn't mean you focus on me, that means you focus on you, and I'll focus on me, okay? So, how about this? The Christian attitude about earning a living. You ought to earn a living. I love what the scripture says. Hey, listen, if you don't work, you don't eat. It would be kind of nice if we got back to that and maybe uh, taught government that that's the way it works also. Amen? The attitude we should have about earning a living is found in Jesus' attitude about his life and mission. Jesus identified his task. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Our Savior teaches us every day and shows us what it truly means to be a servant, to be a minister, to give. Life Life comes to focus not in being served, but in serving others. Stepping outside of our life, our circumstances, our, our selfish focus, and looking around and seeing that there are others who have need. That's what the responsibility of the church is, and we are the church. We are to reach out. We are to be an outreach. We are to go to this lost and dying world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus stressed giving rather than getting. <laughs> I've always thought, well, I think we get it backwards. We think, well, I'm going to help somebody else be blessed in giving and let them do me a favor and let me be the one to do the getting, okay? Jesus' Jesus's entire life was an example of giving himself to others. You talk about where our standard lies, it's in our Savior. It was in keeping with the spirit of the Heavenly Father, for God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave. That's right, he gave his only begotten Son. Key word, gave, gave. Our Lord Jesus Christ has always given himself away. He has always demonstrated what real giving is all about. You know, as you read through the Bible, we're on Wednesday nights, and some of you are missing out on this, we're going through the Gospel of Mark verse by verse. And it helps us to just see the rapid pace and the amazing sense of the lateness of the hour in this dynamic ministry, these three short years that Jesus is in public ministry on this planet. Giving, 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 giving. I would say, Lord, we sure need all the help we can get in recognizing that if we want a heart like Jesus, we want to be Christ-like, 
we're, we're to recognize the importance of the ministry of giving. Did you know that as a whole, if you were to just kind of, you know, cut through all of the stuff out there and look to churches where the gospel is being preached, where they're Bible-believing, you would find that in these churches, are you ready for this? Only, really, only 2% of the church's total income, but that would be uh, those who are in the local church, and then, now, and then this is be all around, is only about... It's only about 2% that give. And even just saying this, I don't want somebody to stop and think, pastor's settling in on, you know, numbers now. Well, what I'm settling in on is that if we gave the way we say we feel about the Lord, if we gave the way we say we feel about uh, this beautiful holiday that's coming up, thanks, thankfulness, did you know that there wouldn't be one missionary that would be unfunded? There wouldn't be one ministry in the church uh, that would not be funded. There would not be uh, one need that couldn't be met if, if we even just use the Old Testament standard of 10%. If the church really did give even that minimum beginning limited standard, I'm telling you, uh, every mission board, every missionary, every work, every need, every building program, every, every outreach, everything would be met. There would be no need for tricks. There would be no need for pushing and prodding and, and, and any of that. And why? Because when our hearts are right, when we're when we're thinking like Jesus, when we have a, a, a heart of giving, revival is happening and God is working. Jesus indicated the secret of, of living is giving. And you know, the real truth is, what a blessing it is. I, I, I think I have the privilege of pastoring an amazing group of people who teach me and show me so much every day. I see this kind of giving. But even with that said, to be challenged to go further and to, and to encourage each other to uh, let the Lord really drive this home in our hearts, watch what the Lord will do. As a matter of fact, when Jesus invited people to, uh, uh, he, he said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. May I tell you this? This is who our Lord is. He is a giver. He is a giver. He's a giver. We see that Jesus frequently warned his followers against greed and covetousness. You know, the real truth is we're pretty comfortable. <laughs> How many people had a pretty, uh, you know, comfortable sleep last night? Uh, well, maybe if you didn't sleep, it wasn't because you didn't have a comfortable bed with a roof over your head and a nice car to drive uh, from work to home and to church. We're, we're a very blessed people. I mean, we really are. We, we, uh, we enjoy... We're only a small percentage of the whole world, but we enjoy uh, blessings just that are beyond, you know, comprehension for other parts of the world. There's no doubt about that. And this real issue of, of, of giving is because if all we're doing is getting, we're not going to be able to do what the Lord would have us to do. Jesus frequently warned against Greed, covetousness. <laughs> you know, you look at these commercials on TV, right? If any insomniacs, you don't have to be willing to. If you are an insomniac, I want to make sure that I'm texting you about 2 o'clock in the morning. Anybody like that? 
Some of you say, you do, preacher, okay, okay. You watch these commercials, right? And in 28 minutes, if you buy this widget, this little thing, it will change your life. And uh, for today and today only, if you'll buy it right now, we'll send you another one for free. We'll just charge you double for shipping and handling, amen? And, and how about when we walk into a store? Did you know that there are people who, who make a living figuring out ways to set things on shelves that get your attention and cause you to buy it? They're called in-cap displays. They're designed to get your attention. I've mentioned this before, but they're, they're supposed to be at eye level. And I, I've never understood that because eye level for Pastor Ashley is different than eye level for Benny Mejia. So, you know. But we do that. Hey, how many, how many would say, I'm going to say this. You know someone who, when they decide that they're going to run into Walmart and get this one little thing, they come pushing a whole shopping cart out full of a bunch of other stuff. Oh, I know. You're sitting by that person right now. Or it's you. Right? It really is the way we are. It... <laughs> You know, I, I take, you know, I call my wife and tell her, you know what? I walked in the store and they didn't have what I wanted. And I walked out and I didn't buy anything. Matter of fact, I had to find a way out of the store because they want you to go through the line. Right. That's who we are. That's the way we are. We are, by nature, in the flesh, a greedy people. We covet. We do. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it goes. I... I you know, there's some really pretty airplanes out there that I really like. I'm just saying. And you're saying, what? Yeah, I'm a pilot. And, you know, I'm thinking, I'm still waiting for the church to vote on that church airplane. Amen? <laughs> I just think, you know, that would be a good thing. The real truth is, we have more than we can even imagine. We have so much. Yet, what do we do? We find ourselves coveting. We find ourselves uh, being greedy. We know what the Bible says. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. These great verses in Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21, we know them, many of them. Uh, many of us have given these scriptures up to memory. It really is a heart condition, isn't it? How about me? How about you? Where is our heart. In Jesus' story to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, we just actually studied this also in uh, our uh, going through the gospel of Mark, where the rich young ruler in, in the scripture basically asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response was, was phenomenal, but he knew where this guy's problem lied. And he, and in, in, in Mark, I, we just studied this, he loved this man and he told him, you need to give everything away. <laughs> you need to not be so attached to your possessions. And he went away brokenhearted because he just couldn't let go. He could, I mean, literally, recognize that that was exactly where his problem lied. We read of the successful farmer, the one who is going to build barns and bigger barns and, you know, bigger, bigger, bigger barns. His problem wasn't that he wasn't good at what he was doing as far as farming is concerned. It wasn't that he wasn't a good manager. It was that his heart was wrong. He he as far as the Lord was concerned, was a fool to, to be so covetous to want to hang on to surplus that he was not willing to have a giving heart. 
You see, this isn't something that, that the church just likes to, you know, drive home and dwell on. This is what we see, this theme from Genesis to Revelation. It's all about having a giving spirit and a giving heart. Being careful to, to challenge ourselves in this area of covetousness and greed. Jesus tells a story about the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, I, I, this is one of my favorite passages when I want to preach on hell. Let me just tell you. Luke chapter 19, amen. It's all there. Everything that you can find. But look at what was a major problem for the rich man. His riches. That's what was a major problem. And may I say that, that for you and I, this is an ongoing, continual concern in all of our lives. That we don't get sidetracked or pulled away from the main thing our central focus, and that's loving the Lord, having a passion for the things of the Lord and growing in our walk and relationship with Him. Paul's commandments about earning a living uh, ring true, don't they? In our text this morning, Ephesians 4.28, a thief who has become a Christian is admonished to, to do honest work with his hands. How many are all for that? Amen? Amen? Such honest toil will contribute towards continuing growth and also make it possible for the Christian to contribute to others who are in need. There's something about what the Lord does in our own spirits when it comes to good, old-fashioned, honest work. Amen? You know, there's such a greater appreciation for, for what the Lord has blessed us with when we're willing to step up and step out and, and do what needs to be done. And I, I just got to tell you, you're a total deadbeat if, if you don't get this. <laughs> I, I mean, the real truth is... Uh, we're, we're raising a whole generation of people who, who actually believe, are you ready? That the government should take care of all of their needs, that they don't have to excel or work hard in school, that they don't have to do their very best. They don't have to go out and find a job. They don't have to do any of these kinds of things. Somebody else should be you know, taking care of all of their needs. By the way, that's also a good way not to think you need the Lord at all, amen? I don't need the Lord. I've got the government. Well, I'm here to tell you that God is doing more than you think when he is working in your heart and in your spirit to go out and work and do, uh, uh, do a good job. The scripture lesson of the morning limits food and services to those who Work Obviously, the text assumes that, that one is healthy, able, and has opportunity. There are special circumstances, special situations, special needs, and that's where we're able to come in. If we're healthy and able to work, we're going to be a blessing and a help to others. The, the scriptures admonish us to, uh, to take care of our widows and, and our children, and we take this responsibility very seriously. But, you know, can I just say... Uh, if you've got somebody that's still sitting around the house and they graduated from high school 25 years ago, kick them out. <laughs> Tell them to go to work. There's, there's a problem when we see this happening as much in Christian homes as it's happening in the world today. Secondly, the Christian attitude toward management of resources. Okay, I think we can all agree. Get out there. Do the best you can. Work. Work hard. And, and, and be careful to, to, to give God all the glory and praise that you're able to work. Amen? Amen? But now that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, what should be our attitude toward management of resources? What did we say? The word stewardship means management. 
The word stewardship means management. The word designates the role of a trustee who serves as the manager of a, of a house uh, working for the owner. We're working for the owner. We're managers of what, in fact, is God's. The Christian sees life as a manner of total stewardship. That means every area of our life is about stewardship. All of life, with its resources, is a gift from God to be managed. The Christian finds it meaningful to be a trustee under God over life as a trust. May I just say something? We have a great responsibility and a high calling uh, to be good managers of what, in fact, is God's and everything is his. Faithfulness is, is uh, faithfulness in such management is the basis uh, for how the Lord will deal with us. That's true. <laughs> uh, good managers, the Lord will bless Managers who recognize that they're to take what in fact is God's and, and invest it and grow it, the Lord blesses that. Managers that hoard it and hide it and bury it, the Lord will take that away from them and give it to somebody else. May I say this? This is a spiritual concern. It really is. Christians, are you ready for this? I thought, you know, you're going to say some of these kinds of things that might just get you kicked out of church. Oh, well. Christians must pay their obligations. Christians must pay their obligations. There should never be any doubt uh, about this manner. And really, you would think that an explanation is, is unnecessary. But the real truth is, we find that this continues to be an issue in too many cases. Look with me. Romans chapter 13. First verse, Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive of themselves, what is the word? That's strong language, damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And then look with me, verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Therefore, ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render, and we know this verse, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. A few weeks ago, actually, this was a passage that was included in my message that talked about us being responsible Christian citizens and recognizing that God ordains and allows whoever is in leadership to be in leadership, but holds us responsible for what we do. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear, and this is not popular preaching today, that, that God might judge our heart and judge uh, our spirit, 
but it really is true. We see that Christians must avoid, here we go, Christians must avoid unnecessary indebtedness. Wow. Some of us can remember a time when in church we actually preached against credit cards. Remember those days? Remember those days? I guess I'm the only one who remembers those days. <laughs> now we recognize that, that most of us don't have cash to buy a car today or cash to buy a house today. You know, I, the, the house that I grew up in, my parents paid $12,000 for. You can't buy a used car for that today, can you? So we're, we're supposed to recognize that we're to be good stewards of God's credit, of God's money when it comes to borrowing. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And you know what? We're not to be... We're not to be in the business of borrowing and, and getting ourselves in debt. I would say that my number one area of talk when it comes to counseling with uh, couples, whether they are newlyweds or, or they've been uh, married for a number of years, is money, indebtedness. And we know how it can grip you and hold you and control you, yet we still continue. I mean, just drive down 23rd. There's, there's, there's more used car lots in McAllen than in the rest of the world, I'm telling you. And they all just say, if you have... Loud, I was going to say something. If you have terrible, terrible, bad, bad, bad credit, we'll finance you. We will. We will. We will. The moment you uh, miss a payment, we're going to take your house and your kids. Some of you might say, that's okay. <laughs> take my kids. I'll keep my house. But, you know, we, we're, we're just crazy. We're overwhelmed, and we just continue to get our... You know, there sometimes... We start to get caught up, and about the time we get caught up, we get ourselves in debt all over again. And then we wonder, what, Lord, why can't you use me? I mean, Lord, I sure would like to be, you know, used in a greater way. I know people, I know preachers who have put themselves in situations where uh, the Lord might be trying to move them to another place or call them to another ministry, but they're so indebted that they can't move. <laughs> I'm telling you, We've got to be careful about unnecessary indebtedness. And that's why I said in the beginning, this is not about you now looking over at the other guy and saying, yeah, that's him. That's what I think his, his problem is. Uh-huh, I see the car he drives, and I know, and yet you don't know nothing. This is for you. May I tell you, one person may be walking around in overalls and a holy T-shirt, and you're thinking, well, he must be the most careful one. And he's in more debt than someone else who has nicer things because the one who has nicer things is actually paying closer attention to focusing on the Lord and doing uh, what needs to be done. So it can't be what you think you see in someone else. This is, again, about the Lord. Hey, can, if there's anything that I can uh, in some small way convey to, especially my college students, my young adults, don't. You, you have an opportunity right now right now, to make up your mind not to get in debt. Pastor Ashley and I have talked about how we've seen men called into ministry. God's called me to preach. But you know what? I'm so far in debt, I can't. I got to go and do this and do that, and I can't. And, I, and, and, and so break free. Get this fixed. As a matter of fact, that's why this wonderful resource, the Dave Ramsey class, is, is just one resource that we offer, and we, we plan on doing more. Brother Gary and I were talking about 
uh, Jeff, I think it'd be great that we, if we did something like this every year, a couple of times a year even, to help people get out of debt or not get into debt. You want to be free to be used of the Lord. Amen. Modern spending habits that threaten Christian stewardship. I'll tell you, there, there's nobody here that would say, you know, I don't, I don't love the Lord that much. That's why I don't really give. That's why I don't really do much. There's not going to be anybody here that says, I'm not thankful. It's just like there's nobody here who, who thinks, I don't care if people go to hell. I don't, uh, you know, I don't think we should be talking to people about Jesus. I, don't, I hope there's nobody here like that. But the real truth is the reason why we don't do these things is very much similar. The, the reason why we don't uh, share the gospel is very similar to why we don't uh, recognize the spiritual implications to giving and the importance of that. We get ourselves tied down. We get ourselves preoccupied. And how about our spending habits? The habits of buying things we don't need. <sighs> you know who had a real tough time with the American culture? Were the ones who went through the real, I'm not talking about the imagined, but I'm talking about the real depression. In 1929, the stock market crashed. And there were people that were jumping out of skyscrapers. And then on into the 30s, before we entered into World War II, we suffered a great depression. Only me and Brother Gary are old enough to remember all this, okay? The real truth is, there were people who were who were out there selling apples for pennies and holding on to every, every nickel that they could. And so when America began to prosper again, they began to see their children take on a whole different attitude. No longer thinking that you ought to work hard and, and have savings and do these kinds of things. And it just kind of drove them nuts to see what people could spend money on. As a matter of fact, some of us know that some of our parents are having a tough time when we have a cell phone bill that is higher than what our mortgage is. When we have uh, just things after things after things. And I, I said, preacher, be careful. I'm not just going to give a list so that people can check it off and decide, well, I'm okay there or I'm not okay here. This really is... This really is about you personally before the Lord doing inventory. How about this inventory? Uh, do not distinguish, do not make the mistake of not distinguishing between greed and need. Do I just want it? You know, anybody ever hear of, are you ready? Uh, people who eat emotionally? <laughs> I'm hitting on all those good things, Amen. You're not hungry. It just feels good. <laughs> amen. I hear that, amen. You know what I'm talking about? Hey, have you ever heard of anybody who says, you know what, I just got to go buy something. Doesn't matter what it is. Just point me to the store and here I go. Get, I got my plastic in hand. Emotional buying. How about that emotional crash and burn that takes place after the bill comes due. Huh? Distinguish between greed and need. How about this? Distinguish between enough and surplus. Some of the richest men in the world died anxious because they still didn't have enough. Now I'm all for goals and doing well and 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 Earning a good living, do never, never begrudge anybody who's, who's excelling and earning and doing well. But there are people who, who just never believe enough is enough. And it almost becomes like a, a sickness with them. These are some of the kinds of things that we know, if anybody were to ask us, 
we hold to and believe and, and should be walking in, yet this is what is really, I believe, holding back what the Lord would like to see have done right here on this planet. How about this? The habit of, are you ready? And I've already touched on this, but I'm just going to kind of reiterate this. The habit of spending beyond our means, buying on credit. I, how about we get back to a place where we actually believe, if I can't buy it, I don't need it right now. How about this? How about we just don't decide every single time that we just ought to buy it on credit? You know, I, I can tell you, if you think that, you know, you know, becoming an adult means you move out, you buy all this furniture on credit, you buy all these appliances on credit, and, and now you get to live the good life, that is the biggest, most terrible mistake that you can make. <laughs> I'll tell you, as I was talking about just our used car dealers and others out there, and by the way, if you, hey, I sold used cars. Did you know that? You know, my, you know what my mother-in-law said to me? I mean, nearly 40 years ago? He's either going to be a, a used car salesman or a preacher. <laughs> like they're the same, you know? And they kind of actually are. <laughs> but you know what? Here's what they do. Here's what, and, the, and, and by the way, if you're a salesman, do your very best. Sell it. You know, the greatest, the greatest salesmanship comes in being confident that the most important need that anybody has is Jesus Christ and, and telling people about Jesus. But you know there are need creators. They are the advertisers who convince us uh, that we really need this thing that we really don't need. There are the, the, the ones who just talk about easy credit, easy credit all the time. And credit really is easy. I don't care how bad your credit is, somebody will give you money. That's just the way it goes. You'll pay more interest and you'll be more buried than anybody else. But be careful of this. I, if there's any way that we can help, and, and I know that Pastor Ashley and all of us agree, we want our young people to get a hold of this early. We don't want them to go through maybe what some of us have gone through. Amen? And then we see the disastrous results of our Christian stewardship or lack thereof. Why, why can't we be the, the Christian stewards that we should be? Why are we bad managers? Because we did not heed this advice early on. We allowed ourselves to get caught up in all of this. And now, even if we want terribly to, to be able to to step in and, and serve and help and, and, and be a part of big things that the Lord is doing, we've, we've, we've shackled ourselves and we are, we're not able to. That's why we say it's never too late to start to make now right decisions to move in the right direction. Not so that, you know, we can now be free to, you know, accumulate more stuff, but for for us to be able to focus on who we want to focus on, and that's our Lord and serving Him. And you know, the real truth is, I have talked to people who come down in different places when it comes to fundraisers and things like this. We, we, we see good in fundraisers when it comes to maybe even helping our young people. By the way, buy a calendar, amen? Buy a calendar. But it really is true, it really is true that if, if people were where they needed to be spiritually and where they needed to be financially, there would never be a need for a fundraiser. There would never be a need for a special uh, you know, offering. All of the needs would be met. And you know, what, we're, what we're wanting is for us to grow spiritually us to grow recognizing that our finances are, are the Lord's. And you know, I just think we just need to determine on purpose to have a right, right spirit and a right heart when it comes to this high calling in our life to be managers of God's resources. Everything is His. And you know, 
we can say it and we can really sound eloquent when we say it, but the real truth is we've got to in our heart really truly, truly, truly believe it. And can I ask you to just do this? Do your very best right now to not be thinking about the other guy, to not be thinking about even, you know, your children or your family or, or that neighbor or whoever, and just say, Lord, I want you, I want you, Lord, to have your way with me today. I want you to help me to examine my heart. And there's areas where I need to start shoring some things up and getting some priorities in order so that I might love you more and serve you more. Lord, I, I just want you to have your way today. And I want to do my very best to be a blessing and an encouragement and an example to others. Not, you know, the worst thing in the world is when somebody thinks God has called them to come and pounce on somebody else's head. Okay? We'll let the preaching of the gospel do that, okay? Just, you know, start moving in that right direction. And, and if you're starting out, my friend, I just implore you to get a hold of what we're talking about. Some of you who went through Dave Ramsey's class, some of you who will have opportunity to sign up for other helps when it comes to uh, managing God's resources, take advantage of these things. But let it begin today, even during this invitation. Just say, Lord, you know, I, I, I wish that we could support every single ministry. I wish we could support every single missionary. Lord, I wish that we could, you know, reach more. I wish that we could do even more. Well, let it begin today with, Lord, help me to get right with my finances, get right with you, and, and allow you to be able to use me in a greater way. Let's all stand. Our precious Lord and Heavenly Father, this morning we, we ask you to take hold of our hearts and just speak to us right now, right now about maybe some of what you brought to my attention even this morning. Am I, am I recognizing beyond words, but with real action, that I have been given the privilege of, of managing, of being a steward of what in fact is all yours. It's all yours. It's all yours. Let us take some time and just thank you for the way you have blessed us, the way you have blessed our families, the way you have given us health and, and an opportunity to earn. And let us just recognize the great work that is before us, the great privilege and opportunities that we have. And yes, Lord, even this morning, friend, if you walked in here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, we're not a group of people that just hang out and talk about money all day long. We want to talk about Jesus. And the way we do that is to make sure we're in a position to do that. Friend, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to get saved today. You need to ask Him into your heart. Maybe you're struggling financially and you're having problems at home and you're having uh, family issues the first thing you need is Jesus the first important decision you need to make is to say yes to Jesus believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved my friend come forward let us show you from the Bible how you can be saved and yes let's pray for our church let's pray for Maranatha let's pray for this wonderful local church that God has brought us to that we might serve, that we might continue to make wise decisions and, and recognize our role to, to, to reach more with the good news of Jesus Christ. Speak to hearts, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.